Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Jacob Cohen. Thanks for being on the show, Jacob. You're welcome. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. And I want to remind the listeners just before we get started to go to LifeBridge Capital, go to the contact us page and sign up and I'd love to connect with you. And, and by doing that, you know, we'll schedule a call with you and, and I'll try to help you any way I can at least to connect and uh, look forward to doing that. I've probably talked to a lot of you already, uh, but I look forward to connecting with every one of you eventually. So, uh, but uh, back to Jacob, a little about him before we dive in. Because I know this, this show is going to be very important to uh, it, whether you're a syndicator, whether you're actively looking for deals, or whether you're the passive investor that's wanting to understand, understand this topic to, to be able to talk to, you know, the, your deal sponsor or the syndicator about this as well. This is going to be valuable information for you. Uh, but Jacob received his MBA in finance from Bari and University and his bachelor's degree in liberal arts from, how do you pronounce that, Jacob, that college? Uh, that's a college up in Albany, New York. Uh, actually, it's, a, it's actually an online university. Uh, cool. Well, so mo it was kind of... Uh, yeah, I just couldn't pronounce the name of it. I was just asking you. Yeah, I couldn't pronounce the name of it. Oh, it's called Excelsior College. Excelsior College, awesome. But uh, Jacob is responsible for providing financial solutions to commercial real estate developers and owners throughout the U.S. Over the course of his career, Jacob has been involved in underwriting and placing over $2 billion in transaction volume. And so now he, he works for you know one of the top three multifamily lenders uh, with, with Fannie, Freddie, and HUD. And so I know this is a show you're going to want to listen to and, and to understand you know, where the, you know, the ins and outs of some financing and where to find it. And, and uh, so he's a mortgage broker and I'm looking forward to learning more about this myself. So uh, Jacob, you know, give the listeners a little more about who you are and exactly, you know, what you're doing right now. Sure. So I started off at Walker at a company called Deerwood Real Estate Capital uh, as an analyst underwriting deals for some of the more senior folks here. And ultimately as uh, you know, a couple of years in realized where, where the money was at, it's always on the front end of a company, not on the back end. So I kind of put my, MBA to the side and said, you know, let's let's focus on 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 the cash side of the business and became a producer. Um, I work. I'm a vice president at Walker and Dunlop. Uh, we are, you know, one of the top lenders in the country for multifamily loan, multifamily properties as well as other asset classes. Uh, the company is publicly traded, and we have about 700 employees across the country. Uh, every, each there's different, uh, I guess jobs for each person at Walker and Dunlop. Mine as a producer is to find investors who are looking to peer up their, you know, peer up with good capital. So we're focused on finding the best capital in the, in the country for your deal. Now that will involve, uh, you know, various aspects. Uh, there is a big sales side to it, finding the owners, but I would say a more important part of the job um, is actually underwriting the deal, understanding it, and selling it to the banks, and then working your way through to a smooth and, and great closing. Okay. So there's a lot of things there we need to, we, I want us to be able to cover. Um, let's see. So, you know, you talked about finding the best capital for your deal. That's your, your job, right? You're going to help us find the best capital for our deal. And, you know, tell me, you know, like, when do we contact somebody like you through this process of buying this multifamily property? When am I going to, when should I connect with somebody like yourself? So that's a good question. I would say it's, you know, as you're move, as you're either starting in the business or you're already in the business and you want to understand different capital types that you can, you can use for your property, you may want to talk to someone like me or, you know, there, there are many of us across the country to understand the capital that's available today. Just as an example, Freddie Mac is pretty much out of the business today for commercial multifamily properties. So you may want to talk to someone like someone at a company, let's just say, to say, hey, is Fannie Mae lending today? And if it's not Fannie Mae, who is it? Uh, so there are aspects to who's lending today and who's hot in which markets. Uh, you know, I, you're from Kentucky, Whitney, so close a deal in Louisville. And at the time, Freddie was saying, let's underwrite the deal to 70% loan to value and only a 135 DSCR, whereas Fannie was willing, willing to go up to 80% and a 125 DSCR, which was able to improve, of course, on the loan amount. 
Um, separately, besides for Fannie and Freddie, there are many other lenders out there. There's life companies, there are banks, and we want to understand, are you a syndicator? Are you investing your own family capital? Are you willing to sign recourse? How long of a term do you want? And then aside from uh, called permanent loans, there's a whole nother side to the business of bridge loans where you may want to buy a property and it's a value add deal and you want to get a bridge loan. <clears throat> Sorry, on the bridge loan side, it's always a question of, you know, do you want to sign recourse? Are you looking for the most, the highest loan possible for your deal? And then of course our job would say, you know, if you're looking for the highest loan possible, we want to match you up with the best rate as well. So, you know, I, I mean, the, the loan is such an important piece of buying a large multifamily property, right? The type of debt that, that you get, I mean, I mean, it can make or break the deal, right? I mean, in so many aspects of the type of loan or the, the terms and things like that. Uh, but I wanted to back up just a little bit. So, you know, you're a mortgage broker, you're finding that debt, you're helping somebody like myself find the correct debt or the best debt for our type of property that we're trying to pursue or to purchase. And so, you know, when do we um, need a mortgage broker or, you know, as opposed to not using a mortgage broker? Okay, so just, okay, so back to the first question, I just wanted to finish that was, as far as when you come to somebody like us, you know, you talk to someone in the market, we're kind of, uh, we're, we're there to help you as a consultant, but when we go out to market with a deal, we typically want the sponsor or the investor to actually be, uh, to be in contract, to be, to have an LOI out, or maybe even more than an LOI, have a purchase and sale agreement already done, so when we go out to our lenders and they're bidding on this deal, they know that if they bid and they have the right price and the right rate, they will win the deal. And they're not just waiting to see if the sponsor still is going to get the deal. Okay. So, so you'd like for us to be, have an LOI out at least. Uh, but, but really, I, I'd like to be in, con in communication with you before that so I can understand oh, yeah. how to underwrite, right? I mean, so that way I know about what kind of debt I'm going to be able to get, the terms, the length, the, uh, you know, all those things, interest rates. And, uh, but, you know, could you elaborate a little bit on, on like how, you know, you, you talked about underwriting and then selling it to the banks and, you know, working your way through this process. And so, you know, how does different types of debt affect our underwriting? Okay. So, you know, the, the easy answer to that is, are you going for a bridge loan or a permanent loan? A bridge loan there in many cases will not give a strong return to investors because you're borrowing 85% of costs. Uh, but you're throwing into there a big portion of capital expenditure where you're going to renovate the property. Um, in addition, sometimes you're buying a deal where there's only a 1-0 cover or even a negative uh, debt service coverage ratio, at which point we'll put up an interest reserve and we'll have money there. But investors are in there for the long run. They want to be in there for two or three years and try to really value, add value to the property so they can pull out some equity on the refinance. Um, as far as you know, stabilized loans where someone just wants to kind of beat the S&P, and get a seven to 10% return on his money, uh, where it's more of a permanent loan, then you'd wanna say, you know, what type of permanent loan are you looking for? Uh, some, got, some folks are, especially, you know, family offices where they're not so focused on the returns, but they're more focused on building, building equity, building a, 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 you know, a financial statement. And in such a case, they have no problem with amortization, 25 years, 20 year, they'll do self amortizing loans, uh, whereas most indicators, their focus is returning capital to their investors. And in such a case, we definitely want to push out to 30-year amortization. In addition to that, we want to push for IO, which means you will not be paying any principal payments during the first couple of years as long as we, you know, I just closed on a loan in uh, Brick, New Jersey, where we got four years of IO. Uh, so he has four years of no principal payments, which uh, he, ha he happens to have no investors in the deal, but he still gets a nice strong cash flow, you know, for the next four years. Yeah. So, so I owe interest only just in case the listener doesn't know what that stands for, but you know, you know, four years of interest only, tell me how, how that could make or break a deal. You know, as far as when you're looking at, you know, two years of IO or interest only or three years or four years, you know, how long should we push that? So that's a great question because people ask us, you know, what do I underwrite? Do I underwrite two years or four years? And it really makes a big difference during, you know, two years or one year of IO would make a big difference to what investors will get back. Now, of course, it's all on the front end because anything, when you're paying full principal payments, that's really cash that you should be getting, but instead it's going back to pay off the principal balance of the loan. But uh, most investors, when they put money in the deal, they wanna see a return. So you know, every, every year of IO makes a huge difference. Every dollar we can get our clients makes a huge difference, which is why they hire us. And in many cases, a client will go out to his banks and say, Jacob, you know, my bank has given me 17 million, what can you do? 
And I'll, you know, we did a deal where we got him 21 million after he came to us at the $17 million loan. And in some cases, we can't do better. And we'll say, you know what, you have a great deal from your bank. Uh, most of those cases are for construction loans, though, I would say. Okay, so, you know, you, you, you went into bridge and permanent and, you know, not a little bit. Any other things as far as that's going, that's, we should be thinking about as we're underwriting, underwriting deals, you know, and, and we're thinking about the types of debt, you know, even the, the length of the debt, the amortization, you know, 25 or 30, or even, you know, whether, you know, how, you know, it's a 10 year permanent or, you know, five year, you know, what, what else, you know, walk us through some other things that, you know, what I, I should, I better have in mind when I'm underwriting this property. Sure. So if you're a risk averse and you're worried about the market, uh, you know, where rates are and where rates may be in three years, you may want to really push for a 10 or even 12 year loan to try to keep, you know, rates today are phenomenal. So you want to lock it in and get long term debt, even though, you know, maybe you're going to lose out in five years of doing another cash out refinance, but you'd rather have long term conservative debt. Uh, and some folks are more focused on just, you know, refinancing as, as often as they can, because every refinance is a return of capital that's tax free. And uh, it's, you know, it's super helpful. So it's, it's, I guess it'll depend on, on your, on your, you know, personal feelings of the market and your investors and what they're interested in this market. Do they want to park the capital long term or do they want to kind of cycle this into, you know, many deals over the next couple of years? Yeah. So, you know, I, and I know that's a big question, but I just kind of want to get your, your take on some things to think about. Uh, and it does, it, it depends on your investors, you know, do you know your investors? Do you know what they're looking for? Do they understand, you know, the type of deal that it is and, you know, are you, are you, are they looking for that, you know, big return or, or, you know, return of their capital in year two or three or, or are they okay till year five, you know, or maybe when you plan to exit. Um, right. So um, I think you have to understand your goal and you're in the goal of your investors as well when you're thinking about the type of debt. Uh, but the, but it, it, I've just seen debt, you know, be a, uh, a deal breaker or a deal maker, you know, in so many ways. And so, you know, you talked about uh, selling it to the banks and, and what does that mean? Okay, sure. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a client approach us with a deal uh, that he bought out in Chicago a couple of years ago on a bridge loan. And his goal was to raise, you know, invest money into the properties, raise rents and cash out. Unfortunately, he did not hit his business plan on time. He was, he was behind. It was in the year three, he had expensive debt and he needed another bridge called bridge to bridge. Those are very hard deals to do because lenders saw that you could not execute the first time around. Uh, but he came to us with a whole story of how he had, you know, with different partners, there were various things going on, property managers quitting on him, you know, people getting sick, but a lot of excuses. So we kind of looked at the story and said, there are too many excuses in the story. We cut it all out, really dumbed down the deal for the banks, made it very simple, and we're able to get them a loan to, to, cap, to you know, refinance, and, and we actually got them more capital to, to renovate the properties. Uh, that would be on the story side. So this, there's various examples on the story side of how we will pitch the deal. Um, and as well, when we're talking to lenders, we want to show there's competition, even though there may not be. You know, I closed a $39 million loan earlier this year where we had zero lenders to do the deal besides for one. And we got to close. You only need one lender. Uh, so that's, you know, just as far as pitching the deal. But then on the underwriting side, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a lot of different ways to show the numbers. So we have a lot of fun with the numbers. Uh, but looking at historical numbers, what is considered uh, one-time expenses? What's what's something that's uh, you know ongoing for the property? In addition, we want to show <clears throat> sorry, we want to show how the property is doing phenomenally today. We don't, and sometimes you know maybe a year ago or two years ago it wasn't doing so well. We may leave those statements on the side. Uh, there are other ways to to value the property or underwrite the property. So uh, typically, you'll you will try to get a monthly trailing twelve months, and we'll try to push and we'll say. To the lender, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Sam Sam Bates was on your show from Trinity Capital, and we did a deal for him called the Sydney Baker Apartments. Uh, that deal was something that we took to Fannie and Freddie. We ultimately got more dollars from a CMBS lender, and the reason was was because we underwrote off of the trailing one month statement instead of looking back at twelve months. It was a new property; it was just coming out of construction. The occupancy was going up and up and up. So every month you're going to see a higher number. So we will try to take that the last month's number or the last three months numbers and try to uh, annualize those numbers to show the lender, hey, this is where the property is going to be performing over the next 10 years. Uh, Fannie and Freddie 
not always can look at a T1. They usually will need a T3. And in such a case, they were not able to get as aggressive as a CMBS lender was. The story is so important, isn't it? It is because like you said, you only need, you know, every deal, the debt makes such a big difference to the deal. We did a deal on a, on a comfort in down in Orlando earlier this year and we're saving the bar. We're $20,000 a month in interest payments just because of our refinance. Oh, my goodness, twenty thousand dollars a month—that's a big difference. I mean, that is such a big deal. Oh, wow! So, and that's why we need somebody like yourself on our team, right? So, you know, we can talk about this deal and talk about what's going on, and really, you know, you have you understanding how you know the, the story needs to be built to get the loan better than better than I will or somebody else, right? You know, we're gonna you're gonna help us through that process, and that's exactly what you said. It's your job helping us get the correct debt, and and so. You know, I'd, I'd love to walk through, you know, you talked about working your way through this process and, you know, what do we need to do before and during and after, you know, uh, and through this, would you, you know, just give us, I guess, lay it out a little bit, some things we need to be doing to get through this process successfully. Sure. So when, when we're, the, the first thing we'll do is we'll spend a week, two weeks, three weeks, understanding the deal, underwriting the deal and making a good presentation that we could send out to the lenders that we know. Um, now, people think of us as really the next step, which is finding the right lender. They want, people may want to work with somebody at a bigger firm like Walker and Dunlop or Pushman and Wakefield or JLL or someone like that where they have access to, you know, our company closes several hundred million dollars a week of business. We see hundreds and thousands of lenders coming through our, our, our books that, you know, we know who's aggressive at what time and, and who's the right lender to peer up with, you know, on the various deals that we're working on. So certainly uh, you, want to, you want to be in the market, call it, because I have to be smarter than the investor. And I have to be closing more deals or, or my background, my company, the, the people I work for have to be closing many more deals than your closer uh, in order to be smarter than you. Uh, so uh, on one end, we're, we got to be smarter on the underwriting, but we also got to be smarter on which lenders are the most active and, and would be able to get this loan done. In some cases, it's a lender who just needs to put a loan on their book where it's a bank. And in some cases, maybe it's a new CMBS lender that came on the market and you know they're, they're willing to do a deal at par. They just want to get capital out there so people know they're lending. Uh, so I actually, we closed a loan a couple of years ago where the lender actually ended up losing a million dollars on the deal. Uh, it wasn't, they weren't planning to lose money, but they closed a loan saying, we'll close this loan at par uh, just to get the business. Uh, they ended up, the market kind of went down a little bit at that point and they ended up losing about a million bucks on the deal. But my client has 10 year capital and he's, he's very happy. Wow. Uh, anything, you know, else like before and after finding the lender that, that we need to consider? Yeah. So once you find a lender, you want to make sure that it's a lender that can execute and that will close at the terms they stipulated in their term sheet. Uh, that's something else. You, so another reason why you'd use somebody like us, we've seen them transact before. We know which lenders will, you know, stick to their term sheet and which lenders may, may deviate from it. Uh, every deal has a hiccup at some point, something's going to come up that, just kind of makes it a little tougher. And some lenders will say, all right, how do we fix this? And some lenders will say, there's a hiccup. I want five basis points for that. I want 10 basis points for that. Or I need to cut your loan. So we, we got to understand where the lenders are. You know, right now I'm working on a deal in Denver and they're, it's a bridge loan for a property that's just coming out of construction. Uh, so we have a bid from a New York lender and we have a bid from a Denver lender. The Denver lender is a little bit more expensive, but I'm going to talk to the client and say, hey, we have a guy from New York. He's 40 basis points cheaper, but we, have, but we also have a lender in Denver, who loves the market. They execute all the time. They're 40 basis points higher. I'll let the client choose, but there is a, a, a weighted reason why you'd want to go with someone from Denver, especially on a bridge loan where the lender is kind of your partner on the deal and you want to work with them for the next couple of years until you stabilize the asset. So, you know, I've heard horror stories about, you know, it hasn't happened to us, thankfully, but, you know, like a week before, a few days before closing, you know, the lender decides to back out or the lender decides, you know, we need this instead or, or this is what's going to happen because of whatever, you know, can you give us some examples or things that, you know, that are, that maybe you see that cause deals not to happen, you know, on the lending side um, that, that we need to make sure that, so we can better have our ducks in a row to make sure we're prepared and all that's taken care of. Sure. So in some cases, it's the lender. Uh, there are some lenders we will not work with. You know, they email and call us all the time. And I had a lender show up in my office on Friday and said, hey, Jacob, I've been, I'm in the area. I want to talk to you. And I said hello. And I was, I was nice. But it's a lender we won't work with. 
so there, there are those. And then there are some lenders who are kind of always sticking to the book. They will always close and you could, kind of, you could rely on them. And then there's you know, many lenders in the middle. And, and in that middle is where we kind of have to work with the borrower and work with the lender. Uh, you know, to give you an example, we did a deal in New Jersey that had multiple lenders bid on the deal. Everyone wanted the deal. Uh, it was an office building where uh, my client kind of bought it. It was like 50% occupied. He got it fully leased up to 100% occupancy. Uh, the total, his total cost on the deal was $9 million. Uh, we had a lot of lenders who were kind of the $10 million mark. We had one lender who was willing to lend him $13.5 million. So, of course, when you get a lender like that, we've closed with this lender before, but we are a little bit nervous. You know, he's a CMBS lender, so he has to sell the loan. He has to be able to sell it to a BP's buyer. Uh, so we're, when we talk to the client, we'll tell him, you know, we got multiple bids in the 10, maybe $11 million range, and there's one outlier at $13.5 million. If you want to go forward with this, just know you got to, going into this deal, there is a chance that he won't be able to sell it and he'll come back to you and say, you know, I, I can't get this deal done or maybe I can get it done at $9 million, $7 million, $11 million, but there is risk that you're taking and it's about a $50,000 risk take because that's kind of what the deposit is to go into the deal. Uh, in, in that case, actually, the lender closed as apt and we were totally fine, uh, but it's something that we would be upfront and talk to our clients about to tell them. You know, this is a lender that's a little bit shaky, or this is a loan that we've seen across the market where people, others are not bidding at this level, and we want to be open and fully transparent. And that, that's when it's nice to have somebody like you on our team, isn't it? Because you have these relationships with the lenders, and you understand, you know, many of them are better than we will. Uh, but, but I wanted to ask you, you know, like, how does a company like yours get paid? I know there's listeners who, who don't understand, you know, that depth of the business yet and, and lending, and how, how do you all make money in directing us through that process? Sure. So we're, we're, you guys are our clients. We don't work for the banks. Uh, the banks, you know, we're friends with them. We go out to dinner with them. We may go to a baseball game with them, but ultimately the, the, the sponsors, investors are our clients. So we get paid from the investors. Uh, there's a set upon fee at, when we start up the deal and you know, it's somewhere between called, you know, it's usually that the market is about 1% of the loan amount. Um, it can be negotiated as deals get larger. Uh, so, you know, on a $100 million deal, you may not get a million bucks, but the, 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 we, are, we are an advocate and a, a consultant for the sponsors. Okay. And, you know, I was thinking too about the underwriting. I wanted to go back to that just for a minute. And I, and I wanted you to talk about, you know, let's say I'm looking at a deal and I have my underwriting, you know, and I, I feel like, okay, Jacob, you know, I've got this really good deal. I'd love for you to give me some ideas about debt and see if I'm looking at the debt correctly. And, you know, maybe you and I have already discussed it ahead of time and I, I've got those numbers in there. And then I send you my underwriting model or, you know, my projections and, you know, and then you get to look at it, right. And you see so many people's underwriting, you know, and you're underwriting, you know, so many deals, you know, I'd love for you to talk about, you know, some things that just really kill a deal when you see the underwriting or things that sponsors aren't accounting for, uh, you know, that that's common or maybe not so common when, when you get to see the underwriting. Okay. Uh, good question. So there are various, various aspects to this. Um, you know, on one hand you want, especially on a bridge loan or even on a permanent loan, you want to have some room for error. Rates can go up, loan proceeds can go down, especially on a bridge loan where your exit is, you know, exit is so tight. It's called your exit as a, as a seven and a half debt yield where, you know, lenders can just kind of squeeze in and take a take out loan. There's no room for error there. Um, and including, you know, if they are floating rate loans. So LIBOR can go up, LIBOR can go down. You need to have some room in the deal for, for market conditions. Um, you know, other, other types of underwritings we've seen that kind of need some work is where, where borrowers will have a performa on, on expenses per unit that are not in line with the market. Uh, you know, using someone like us, we have a portfolio of more than $80 billion of loans that we service. We can, we have access to all these multifamily loans across the country. We can see in real time, what does it cost to operate per unit, uh, you know, in utilities and management and in, in, in marketing for each of for, you know, in, in every market and every market markets can be drastically different. Uh, you know, a deal in Louisville, Kentucky could be, you know, three and a half to 4,000 a unit and a deal in, uh, in New Jersey could be eight or $9,000 a unit. So they're, it, you know, especially or deals now in Texas, where where especially like Dallas and Houston, where property taxes all just got raised on everybody. You need to you need to have some room in your deal that you know something out of the ordinary comes in. It doesn't just kill your returns in your deal. 
what do you like to see there for, you know, to account for that room of error or that, you know, just kind of the unknown, right? I mean, we know there's things that are going to happen that we almost can't account for a lot of times. We want to, right? We want to account for everything, but there's usually that, that something that happens that we can't account for or didn't see coming. And we want to have that, that room for error built in. What do you like to see there? Is there a percentage or amount per door? How do you do that? So, I, you know, diversification is what we're taught in uh, business school. So certainly we want to see lots of deals, not just one $40 million deal because you did two $1 million deals a month ago. Now, we really want to see a gradual increase in your in your investments and a, and a diversified portfolio because, yes, there are going to be home run deals and there are going to be some deals that are not going to work as well, but hopefully you don't lose money on them. Um, so that's on one hand. On the other side, as far as just predicting markets, you can't predict it, but maybe give it, you know, one to 200 basis points where if something moves, you still get a return. Your investors will still be happy. They may not be thrilled, but they'll be happy with the, with their investment. What about like entry versus exit caps when you're, when we're talking about underwriting and I know that's going to vary some, but, but anything, you know, could you give us some guidance there on how to think about that? Uh, yeah. So it's, I guess you're talking about a bridge loan, right? Yeah, yeah, either or. Just when we're doing our underwriting, just thinking about the exit cap and the market and some of those things that you're taking into account now when you're doing underwriting. So it'll really depend on the market because you know you could buy an apartment in California where it's going for four and a half, five cap, or you know, in oh, yes. uh, property in in uh, in you know suburban America where maybe a six and a half cap. So it's it's hard exactly to know. You know, it, it depends on the market. Uh, but going in, if it's a stabilized deal. It's fine. You know, like we were talking before about getting IO and things of that sort. Most people predict the properties to appreciate in value. And, you know, the exit is not as, as, as much of a worry as it will be on a bridge deal where you, you really have to have that exit. You have to, you know, that, know that in three years when you're complete, you did all your renovations, you'll be able to cash out of that loan. Now, something unfortunate where, you know, in, the, in, in New York markets where they pass the rent regulation laws, People could have worked for three years, adding value to the property, raising rents, and then all of a sudden, cap rates just went up from four and a half to five and a half percent. So your value didn't really increase, and all your work, uh, you know, was not that valuable. So you can't predict that. Uh, but if you have some room for error and your deals are not that tight, even if there's something that changes, uh, maybe you know, LIBOR can go. Right now, LIBOR is at call it around two percent. It was two and a half six months ago, three months ago. And it was at a quarter of a point to 50 basis points three years ago. So that's almost 200 basis points difference in LIBOR. So you really want to, in some cases, buy a cap on LIBOR to ensure that it won't go up or down too much. Um, and also just kind of build some room into your deal that things can, can move around. Tell, tell the listener what that is, LIBOR. Tell, tell them what that is in case they've never heard that term before. Sure. So LIBOR is an index. It's just uh, the lender will give you a spread and will say, you know, for this deal, I'm giving you a rate of 300 basis points over LIBOR. So if LIBOR is at 2%, you'd be at 5% because you got your 2% of LIBOR, which is your, uh, you know, your, your kind of base. And then uh, you're, you're stuck at 300 over LIBOR. Now LIBOR can move up and down. So one day that 200 basis points could be at 150 or it could be at 350. And, and it could be even more drastic than that. You may want to look at the futures of LIBOR to kind of try to predict where that's going. But in addition, a lot of lenders will require, and even if they don't, you want to buy on your own a cap to make sure that you insure yourself. If LIBOR goes up too high, your rate's not going to shoot up to 10% if LIBOR goes up to, call it, 7%. Nice. So yeah, we're, we're getting really close to running out of time here, Jacob, but, but a few more questions for you. Um, you know, what is the hardest part, specific thing about, you know, just the lending process or working with a deal sponsor uh, to get, you know, to get this deal closed as far as on the lending side? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, it, it's a, it's a big question because there's a lot of, you know, every deal will have something to it that will be hard and, and I, it's not deal specific. So, or it, it is deal specific. So every deal will have something that's hard. In some cases, it may be a new sponsor that's buying a deal that he, that's, that's big for him. So you got to find a lender that's willing to take the risk with the sponsor. In some cases, it's a deal that, uh, you know, maybe it's not a, it's a market that's not so attractive. And maybe, you know, I did a deal in Flint, Michigan during the water crisis, you know, Try finding a lender for that. Uh, but you only need one lender. So we did find that one lender and we got it done. So in that case, that was what was hard. Uh, in some cases, it's, uh, you know, maybe he has a business plan that not everybody believes in. Um, in many cases, some people will say, I'm buying this deal and I'm good. the value add here is not that I'm going to raise rent. I'm not, I'm not going to uh, raise rents over here. I'm going to 
renovate the property, I'm gonna add value because I'm a better manager than the last guy. Those are the hardest deals to sell because you really gotta show the lender that you are a better manager than the last guy. So we'll may, we may wanna start looking at your portfolio and seeing how you operate your other multifamily properties, cost per unit, and if the other guy was at 10,000 a unit and you can operate it at 5,000 a unit, uh, based on your other properties, it's something we can show the bank and try to try to get them on board. So is there a way that you've recently improved your business or, or the company has recently improved just so, something that we could apply to our business as well? It, it could either, it could be something you personally have done, you know, just the way that you operate or something, you know, at a bigger level within the company. Okay. Uh, good question. So when I started out in the business, I was, you know, doing a lot of cold calling, you know, LinkedIn and things of that sort called online social media or over the phone. Uh, kind of when I, yeah, a couple of years ago realized this is really a people business. Uh, so you really got to meet people. You really got to go to conferences. You got to get out there. So, uh, you know, meet, uh, it's, it's annoying to put on a suit and, and meet somebody at a restaurant or, or go to their office or have them come to your office, but that is the way deals happen. So you wanna meet the brokers out. If you're looking for deals, you wanna meet the brokers personally, show them who you are, show them you're real. In our case, we wanna meet the sponsors, talk to them about deals we've done, but in person and over the phone and through LinkedIn and other social media avenues, haven't seen such a good return on, on my time uh, versus you know going to a conference, meeting somebody. And, and, and then in the, I guess on the other side of just be open. Uh, you know, we, in, in, I mentioned an example where I'm saving, I saved someone $20,000 a month. He was open to meeting me at a conference. Uh, you know, if he said, I already have a broker, that deal was actually shot by two brokers previously to, before we got it. So he had two other brokers look at the deal, send it out to the market and could not find a lender. We found him multiple lenders and he ultimately went with one of the lender that kind of fit well for his business plan but he was open to meeting us. And I typically see the, the bigger the companies are, they usually are more open. The bigger, the, the, you know, the, the larger, go after larger guys because they are typically more open than the smaller guys who are, you know, very focused on what they have and, and they don't, they're not, they're not always as open as, as believing that there may be something better out there. And what is the one thing that's contributed to your success? That's uh, gotta be just, just, pushing forward and never, never, never hearing now and just working really hard because, you know, you can meet, you know, I mentioned a conference. I've been going to that conference for three years in a row, uh, you know, never closed a deal from that conference until this year. And, and that was multiple trips to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, you know, preparing before the conference, setting up you know, 20, 30 meetings at the conference, following up for months afterwards, and then finally you get a deal closed. And as we know in this business, you know, you close a couple deals, it is, you know, deals are big and, and you know, one deal on a, on a going to a conference for three years is well worth it. Hmm. Yeah. And I appreciate you mentioned too, just the follow-up, you know, you went there, you know, three years and, and just all the follow-up setting up all those meetings. That's time consuming. I do that myself. And I mean, that's how our team does. And that's, that's a lot of work. But oh yeah. And I'd much rather underwrite alone. <laughs> so we got to <laughs> right. push ourselves on the sales side and, and, and get out there and meet people even though we all have things that we'd rather do. I'd, I'd give up a lot to sit behind a computer and look at Excel all day. <laughs> so Jacob, you know, you've been a great guest and this has just been, a, it's a, such an important topic in our business. And I appreciate you elaborating on, on so many details that we need to understand and, and getting to know somebody like yourself, but and, and, you know, tell the listeners how you like to give back. Sure. So I, I give back in various ways. You know, I volunteer in the community on in various not-for-profits uh, but of course, you can, the easiest way to give back is with money. Time is much harder. So uh, we give back to the schools that we're involved in, but uh, we get to volunteer a lot uh, in, in various events with the schools that we send to, with the community, uh, you know, various things within the community that we'll try to volunteer our time for. But of course, money is important. And we give back a lot uh, on that front to, you know, people who can't afford to, to buy food, people who can't afford to buy clothing. And in some cases, it's, it's just, you know, adding things to the school that wasn't there before or different things that you can just try to help out and make a difference because we are lucky we're living in this century where there's just so much capital out there and there's we're we're, we're blessed to be in uh, be living in this generation and uh to tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you most importantly and, and learn more about you or connect with you sure i'm jacob cohen i work for walker and dunlop you could google me uh you can give me you can send me an email it's jacob.cohen at walker dunlop.com uh but you know just quick search of Jacob Conan Walker. I'm the only Jacob Conan Walker in Dunlop. 
thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.